So today we're going to be talking about meaning and images. What is visual language? And so to preface this lecture, um, it's really important in our class to really start thinking about how you can look at an image and start to decode its meaning based on descriptions of what you're looking at. So today I'm going to be presenting you with a series of visual metaphors, images to think about, and images that incorporate a lot of interesting juxtapositions, both illustrations, collage, things that are composited digitally. At the end of this lecture, I'm going to talk about our major projects for this quarter to give you all an idea of where we're getting headed. So here we go. So uh, the first illustration that I've included is an interesting illustration by Riger. And if you look at it closely, you might start describing it as an illustration. It's something clearly that another human being has drawn or designed. It's two faces, kind of, that are looking at each other, but each of the faces is actually composed of dif different cogs and wheels and gears. I would ask you guys to think about, you know, what do you think this image might be saying beyond just being a nice picture of two automaton looking beings staring at each other uh, with their robotic heads? Well, we know that there's a plank that's linking both of their mouths and on that plank there's a bunch of people on either side who are in a sort of tug of war with various ropes and so the jump here that you might come to the conclusion of is this idea that maybe this is representative of a political machine or an argument or two sides of an issue um, you know if that plank with the people experiencing this tug of war, if that didn't connect their mouth, but connected their eyes instead, you might have an interpretation like these two people, they don't see eye to eye. But instead, because the plank links the mouths, there's sort of an idea that this is a, a war of words. But there could be a lot of different in interpretations for this given image. And so what we're gonna be talking today talking about today is this idea of visual metaphor. Here's another illustration. Take a close look here. There's a really big tiger who's sleeping on the ground. Um, there's a teeny tiny chihuahua dog on one side of the tiger. And then on the other side, there's a man who's clutching the tiger's back as he fearfully gasps at this dog who's barking at this little tiny dog who's barking at him. Um, the illustration itself is simple in the fact that we have these sort of three characters interacting in one way or another, but perhaps the visual metaphor that we could draw from this, and you might have uh, ideas as well, uh, is maybe something to the effect of don't sweat the small stuff or don't miss out on the big picture. Because who knows, if that tiger wakes up, it could get really bad for this guy in the office coat. I'm including this image because it's actually composed out of a very limited color palette. It's only white, green, orange, and then we have um, a purple color that's used to outline these very sort of simple buildings and trees in a park area. But even with something that looks like it could be an editorial uh, in a magazine, but it could also be from a children's book, we have this scene that seems to be communi communicating something about um, togetherness, uh, urban parks, sharing resources, community, urban farming, um, all of those are implied by this really sweet, powerful, uh, and yet very simple image. Here's another pretty complex illustration to take a look at, and there's a lot to take in on this one. There's a woman sort of wearing like a 1960s Mad Men type outfit, and she's in this little sort of office box uh, that's covered in different holes all around from floor to ceiling and there's all of these men who are peering in at her as she works at her desktop. 
And so you can really start to extract, well, is this how women are being monitored in the workplace? The inability for females to advance in the office place or in the workplace? Is it that all of her actions are being tracked and data is being collected from what she does on social media? And so the, the men who are recording data are actually uh, sort of a part of the computer or a part of a screen that's tracking what she's doing. And so the image becomes a bigger political conversation beyond the picture that we're looking at. Um, so I'm sure you guys might have other interpretations as well, and that's kind of the beauty of this process, is that different images can have a whole myriad of interpretations. Here's a, an interesting illustration by Sebastian Thibode, and in this we see uh, the silhouette of a female figure where her whole chest area and her stomach uh, include negative space that forms this angry face as her fist is up in the air and you can't help but jump to the conclusion of this is uh, someone demanding rights for women or female rights or potentially trans rights. There's a lot of potential interpretations with this uh, image rendered in a very simple way. Another illustration by Sebastian Thibode. And for those of you guys who are on social media, you can probably read this one pretty quickly uh, to say that this clearly looks like a dude who looks like the Facebook logo, who looks like he's opening up this uh, trench coat and exposing all of his information in addition to all of his privates. Um, this unclothed or declothed, super vulnerable person. What's interesting about this illustration that I would point your attention to as well is the fact that the whole Facebook news feed or the Facebook profile is all rendered as just little lines. So we don't even have any text on this that tell us that it's Facebook. But because we read the image of a dude's profile with blue hair and a blue trench coat in this very specific color of blue, we can immediately draw that conclusion that this is a critique of Facebook and um, people willingly giving so much of their personal information to this social media site. Here's another interesting example and this one is not an illustration but rather a collage of different pieces of newspaper or newspaper newsprint and in this uh, editorial image by Mike McQuaid, it was featured alongside a piece called Who Gets to Write What? So when we're talking about bias in journalism or bias in the news, who's writing about what groups of people, those questions are brought up because we have three very different um, pieces of paper from different people. And yet our eyes in this magical moment of gestalt sort of connect them into a single face or a single head um, and all of a sudden this very simple strategy becomes super powerful in terms of thinking about the the writers behind our news sources. Now for something a little bit less political but very interesting this is a project called Goblin Guts and uh, the artist here Nate James worked alongside um, two guys who were writing and producing a song and a title for that song each day. And so they would send the song and the title of the song each day during this collaboration over to Nate James and say, we want you to create artwork that accompanies this specific song. So these collaged visuals are actually um, the daily collages created that go along with the music. And what's really interesting about this is that each of these collages has its own kind of implied narrative um, without knowing really what the lyrics of the song are or what the, the music is actually about. The images themselves, in my opinion, you might agree or disagree, uh, they sort of stand alone uh, as their own strong stylistic collages. Um, and 
Nate James is, of course, sourcing from magazines, from maps, from old photographs, um, and then really deconstructing these di digitally and then recomposing them into powerful images meant to accompany uh, a sonic experience. This one sort of has an art and design joke here at the bottom where we have um, the, the various colors cut out that correspond to uh, a color palette or um, a, a printing process. In Laura Lee's work, uh, she creates immaculate collages out of both her own paintings as well as um, pictures of landscapes depicted in magazines. And for this project, she asked about 100 people aged 20 to 30 to text their mothers. Um, and these are uh, primarily Korean Americans who were asked to text. Uh, so they asked their, their mom the simple question in Korean, what are you doing, mom? And so she picked uh, six typical replies. She then depicted the mothers according to their texted replies, which became the actual titles of the individual pieces. So in these digital collages, um, I mean, clearly her response back from uh, the young people who are texting their moms, uh, their moms are all sort of engaging these other like fairly boring or banal or everyday activities like eating hot buns by the beach. And yet you have this beautiful, expansive collage that incorporates both painted elements as well as these uh, scenic landscapes that are sort of stacked on top and form this incredible backdrop for uh, this very humble mum eating a bun next to a sign for hot buns. And it's really powerful and sweet at the same time. Maybe in this one, the mom texted back, I just got back from the grocery store and now I'm going to church doing laundry. Working out in the park. It's just so, there's so much detail happening here. This one's my favorite, uh, watching TV. I think this one's my favorite because it's such a simple image. There's literally a white TV that's on, almost like it was a long exposure with a camera. And then this mom just laying on the sand with her like super hot pink tight shorts, um, watching TV or maybe doing a workout, going along with a workout video. Shopping at Uniqlo, trying things on. Uh, Michael Robinson is really inspired, or makes collages that are really inspired by um, video games, action films, uh, but they become these objects other than what they're made out of, if that makes sense. So he'll source different pieces from landscape, or photos of machinery, or rock formations, and then composite them all into a single form or thing, uh, like this piece, Obsidian Superstar, from 2015. Uh, the Seacrest Gallery writes, Robinson's new suite of collages produces a similarly otherworldly effect, forging fantastical floating worlds out of materials culled from a wide range of photographic and illustrated sources spanning the past 60 years. Stone Age tools, circuit boards, floral arrangements, kneeling figures, strangely hued drips and open landscapes all coalesce into dynamic compositions, proposing haunted and humorous interrelationships between history, technology, and the natural world. And you can absolutely see this happening in some of his pieces, which include imagery from the surface of the moon combined with these sort of glitched out screen captures with melting uh, paper collage that's stacked on top. I look at this one I, and I think specifically of the persistence 
of time, the Salvador Dali piece with the melting clocks. There's something very surreal about um, seeing these forms on top of like a mushed cupcake wrapper or, or whatever that thing is in the bottom. And what's, what's great about his work is that you really lose this sense of gravity or gravitational pull um, in the way that, that things are related to each other in the collage. There's a really interesting relationship between the object or the mass with gravity and the laws of, of physics. So um, if you are interested in checking out more work like these, um, I've included oops, a few links for you to continue exploring if you're looking for inspiration from uh, the Walker Art Museum. Cargo Collective is a really great resource. Uh, 3 by 3 magazine also shows a lot of interesting contemporary artworks. Um, I've included just a couple more to look at, um, and these are um, sourced from a couple of artists who have gained quite a bit of traction on Instagram and social media for uh, their work in collage and digital collage. Uh, for example, Sarah Shaquille uh, utilizes um, images from magazines combined with glittery things and galaxies, which she combines into these really effective editorial looking images. She actually posted a similar image to the one you see on the right here with the, um, the bathtub and the glitter water coming out into the glitter bathtub, but instead it was a sink and someone was washing their hands in the glitter. And of course it had to do with the COVID-19 outbreak and the reminder, the constant reminder to wash your hands. Again, these are really simple moves that really transform her original source image into something totally different. And then Danai uh, Goki uh, is a digital collage artist as well, um, who is both shown in galleries, but it also has a very uh, successful Instagram practice. Um, I definitely encourage you guys to check out her work. Um, these are composited old photographs with magazine imagery and her own images to create these strange and surreal environments like um, a bride from a bride's magazine standing in the middle of this like futuristic street with a bunch of bagpipe players behind her and yet the whole foreground of this image is flooded with cameras. So to me it speaks to our um, consumerist culture, our media culture, and the cultural and societal expectations. Uh, Denai Goki is an ar architect and a digital artist who's lived, studied, and worked in both Greece and the Netherlands. And since 2013, she's been exploring a particular style of digital illustration by narrating surreal and sometimes dystopic urban stories. Uh, and she says, I'd like to think that my work has a pessimistic political reference. I started working with collage in 2012 on a period that Greece was deeply affected by the economic crisis, which strongly reflected on the society, therefore on the image of the city of Athens. There is no longer outside, the title of my first piece, was an attempt to depict capitalism as a dystopia of an infinite interior. Super deep. Um, and quite resonant with some of the issues that we're facing politically and in a time of economic crisis ourselves. She continues by saying, coming from the field of architecture, I'm deeply interested in the dynamics of space and the built environment the urban lifestyle and its aesthetics, the pleasure of urbanity as a space of togetherness and isolation at the same time. Those are the concepts I tried to explore as a digital artist. Um, but visual metaphor, of course, doesn't just apply to the world of contemporary art and contemporary artists who are making uh, meaningful work, but also to the world of design. Um, because the ability for images to communicate is 
something that is hugely important in the world of marketing, of advertising, and part of what we're going to be working towards in our class is helping each other understand how to talk about, how to decode images, and how to make images that do this quite successfully. A lot of people talk about art and design as being very separate, or there's artists who make work all by themselves in a studio and make paintings that never sell, and then there's uh, artists who make money, like graphic designers. I would ask that you guys throw all of these ideas, this whole dichotomy, out the window. To be an artist, to be a visual artist, I think, is to understand that those are not two separate things, but rather the successful people in either of those industries or whatever you choose to work with have to have an understanding of how images communicate language. So I've included some examples that you might not find in a gallery or an art museum, but rather on a billboard or in a magazine or in an Instagram advertisement. Um, starting with this quite fascinating ad series by IBM. It says, now more suitcases find their way home. And in this particular image of the suitcase, there's uh, an image of the house that exists in the ne negative space of the handle, which is a super smart way of merging these two ideas between the suitcases and being home. Uh, and also lets them give a shout out to Amsterdam Airport um, moving baggage utilizing IBM. Drivers now see traffic jams before they happen. Uh, IBM helps Singapore's traffic moving by predicting congestion an hour in advance with 90% accuracy. And here we have a, an image that is simultaneously a face looking through binoculars but those binoculars also form the negative space that becomes this physical image of the car on the road. Please donate blood. Don't let supplies get any lower from the blood center of southeastern Wisconsin. In this picture of a flag, the American flag, everything is whited out except for the group of 50 stars and then the very last red stripe on the flag. And so even though this image doesn't have text that gives you this message, the image communicates to you the American thing is to give blood. The patriotic thing to do is give blood. Not giving blood is un-American. And all of that is contained within this single image of a flag with only one bottom red stripe. Church of the City, an interesting um, visual metaphor here, and I apologize for the quality of this image. It looks a little bit pixelated on my screen here, um, but I think you can get the idea. There's a, a, a guy crossing the road and one of the road markings is a cross, but it has this sort of cool Instagram filter and vignette around the outside of it. So it seems like it's the cool urban thing to do to attend this church in the city. This is a really great online campaign by Orkin, which uh, creates quite a few products for killing flies who are around your house. In this first online campaign, this was a banner advertisement that went out. So if you're clicking around and then you see it come up, if you moved your little mouse over this um, Orkin bug zapper, it would actually zap your mouse and then like a facsimile copy of your mouse would fall down to the bottom of the advertisement until you collect all of these dead uh, arrows from your mice that look like a bunch of dead flies. And in a similar way with this uh, sticky fly catching tape that they created, it says pests don't stand a chance. If you brought your mouse over the sticky tape, your mouse, a copy of your mouse would be stuck to that tape over and over and over again until you hypothetically could fill up that whole tape with these little copies of your, your mice. And then in the process, your brain transforms the picture of your arrow into a stuck fly. Mount Sinai, minimally invasive sports surgery. 
right? Take a look at this advertisement. Um, it's a baseball that has just one little stitch in it with the, the classic baseball red stitching um, to talk about minimally invasive sports surgery. Uh, this one's one of my favorites. Dr. Carver's Easy Shave of Butter. Um, <laughs> there's something really visceral about looking at that kiwi that's been slightly scraped and painful about that slightly scraped kiwi, uh, knowing the image that we're looking at. It says butter safe than sorry, transparent formula for a smooth and gentle shave. What's great about this visual, even though it's a still life of fruit, one's mind immediately makes the connection that this is about more than looking at a banana with two kiwis. Amazing what our world of emojis has transformed our fruits and vegetables into. The Art of Shaving, Barber Spa. Uh, in this one, the negative space of the hand is both the beard and the hand. It implies this movement of the hand sweeping across the face and in essence, shaving this guy. Nike Air Max shoes are being shown here as um, connected lungs. The shape of the Air Max shoe matches up completely and includes all of the detail. Uh, and all of a sudden this image is not just an advertisement for Nike Air Max, but says, you know, if you wear these shoes, you'll run better, you'll have better lung health. Th these shoes are good for you. Clean, healthy lungs. Uh, an environmental campaign by WWF, uh, which many of you are probably familiar with this logo, ran a campaign where they installed physical paper towel holders, and all of these paper towel holders had uh, green paper towels, but uh, the cutout behind the paper towel holder was uh, a whole continent. Um, and so as you pull the paper towel away, um, the amount, the level of green in that continent becomes lower and lower as a sort of visual plea to use less paper, to use less paper towels. So with a little bit of context here about um, how design and the language of design, visual metaphors, uh, play into the world that we see every day on billboards, on our screens, um, sharing photos or memes with each other. Uh, it's one thing to consume imagery. It's another thing to create that imagery and to decode that imagery. So I hope that that trajectory of slides is helpful and of course you can always go back and just pull up the lecture to revisit some of those artists and do a deeper dive and deeper exploration into their work. I thought I'd also show you guys uh, a bit of an introduction to some of the projects you'll be working on in our class. Uh, all of the descriptions, more examples, and the specifics as far as project parameters are all listed in D2L under the tab that I showed you called Project Descriptions. But I hope this gives you perhaps a little bit of inspiration and encouragement and insight into what you'll be working on in our class. Uh, the 1 in 20 project will be a grid-based uh, image sourcing project that deals with figuring out how to use different image sizes, large image sizes, and operate within a tight resolution. So you're really going to start understanding how to utilize images and ensure that you're not pixelating anything. So uh, you'll pick one word and figure out 20 different image associations with that word. For example, this student picked the word roll and she has everything from uh, a cinnamon dessert roll to a toilet paper roll, a roll of I voted stickers, sushi, a Kodak film. Um, she cropped out the majority of the text in what we can identify as a fruit roll-up, uh, rock and roll, Tootsie Roll, rollerblades. It's a Rolls Royce. Um, she's really thought about all of the image interpretations of that word. 
uh, this student selected a word uh, vain or vain. So she kind of utilized both interpretations of that word to construct her 1 in 20 project, which includes both um, veins in nature, a person being vain, a character, a cartoon character in a video game named Vane, and so on and so forth. You'll be creating an imaginary landscape where you utilize your own um, sourced images, photographs, drawings, paintings, pictures of food that's around your house to create a new environment. Um, and you'll make three different versions of your imaginary landscape. So this student created these food-based landscapes. This one was really carb heavy. So there's bread, pretzels. She uh, utilized scans of Cheez-Its, which she created a pattern on this woman's pants with and a belt buckle that's a pretzel. Um, and then her other two images transform these urban areas and murals into uh, foodscapes as well. Uh, this student utilized her own illustrations combined with pictures from magazines uh, to create her landscape environments. Your second project, or your, excuse me, your third project is the playlist on vinyl, where everyone in the class will be switching a playlist that you've created in Spotify or YouTube with a very specific concept or theme in about 10 songs. You'll be switching with another one of your classmates to design three different vinyl record covers at the, the size and scale of an actual 12.75 by 12.75 vinyl record. And uh, you won't use any pictures of the artists or musicians that are included in that playlist, but instead think about a way to incorporate that title of the playlist with an environment that totally complements uh, the vibe, the feeling, and the idea of the playlist that your colleague has created. And so in this uh, project, you'll be acting both simultaneously as the artist and the designer. In, excuse me, the artist and the client, um, the designer and the client for someone um, as you work towards creating vinyl record covers for this project. Your fourth project will be designing uh, an entire alphabet, 26 letters, as your own typography. In Illustrator. Uh, this student used um, these beautiful drawings of uh, palms and ferns for her different letters which became incorporated into the typography. So what you're creating will actually be a usable font that you can download and install in your computer and work with. So our last project this quarter is called the Digital Zine. So you'll be taking all of the skills that you've learned in Photoshop and Illustrator, and you'll be applying them to a zine, which you create and present digitally. So it'll be a final PDF that you lay out, or it'll be an Adobe Spark presentation, which your colleagues can view online. and. Uh, a digital zine will talk about what that means and what that looks like and a little bit of its DIY history starting off in sort of the punk rock times of the 1980s, 1990s and how that might apply to contemporary zines in contemporary art. So the first two examples I'm going to show you are both by uh, students and then the last example is by Emily Carroll who's a working digital zine illustrator. Um, uh, professionally. So yeah, let's check out the this digital zine by Brianna called Do You Love Me Now? So in Brianna's digital zine, we have um, a title page. So if you think about it, it kind of opens and folds into itself. And she's implemented both text graphics that she's created in Illustrator as well as scanned images made with pixels in Photoshop. And um, 
these sort of become overlaid on each other uh, and she's altered and changed the colors of many of the scans that she's included. Like for example, I think these are cotton balls or marshmallows, but she's shifted the color over to where all of the shadows are pinks. And then she's included some of her own handwritten text that becomes the poetic part of the zine that really ties it all together. And it's sort of a melancholic poem, the sweetest thing I've ever known, and deeply sighs our woven melody. And based on the layout of the text, you sort of get a feel for the cadence. She had mentioned that she actually found this old wedding photo uh, near her apartment on the ground all crumpled up. She picked it up and scanned it and included it as a part of her digital zine as well. But really what I'm looking for in this final project, and I definitely encourage you to start thinking about it right now, is how can you incorporate the digital collage, the graphical creation that you've learned all throughout the quarter and apply it to a narrative or non-narrative or non-linear narrative um, zine, including photographs, scans, potentially drawings, text, handwritten text, graphical elements, or for example, these scanned heart stickers, which already feel super graphical and, you know, she could have transformed all of them into actual graphics and illustrator, but there's definitely a, a sort of feeling of authenticity looking at, you know, an actual broken scanned phone that's kind of falling apart or scanned candle wax down here. Another example of a digital zine was created by a student during quarantine in the pandemic uh, and her zine is called drab a zine and she's included photographs of herself and has altered the colors um, included crumpled up pieces of tape as an added component utilized a font that is uh, text incorporated with little hearts and then many different photos that she's digitally collaged of both her medication as well as um, a Game Boy Advance, a hair bow. And so all of a sudden you get this sort of portrait of this person and uh, the ways that she describes herself. And her goal with the zine was to present something that sort of in opposition or in contrast to a typical editorial magazine. And so it becomes very performative, very much uh, Cindy Sherman photographer, sort of implied narrative with the poses, the postures, the disheveled rooms and the disheveled kitchen. And uh, so she's including her photographs and then digital collage through Photoshop and then um, text, text graphics that she's created in Photoshop or Illustrator as well. And I think there's some really compelling moments like this one where you have a repeated image a couple of times and then ends sort of in this deflated sort of way, um, kind of encapsulating a lot of the feelings or the anxiety of uh, living during a worldwide depression and global health crisis uh, as a sort of underlying um, motive to this particular zine. And then very differently, uh, another digital zine by Emily Carroll, which we'll go into a bit more when I show you more examples going into the actual project. But she's an illustrator who combines her illustrations and text, but it's sort of like a, a, a a scroll that brings you into more and more sen uh, of a sense of, of doom. And you can see as you keep scrolling through these trees, you see this pile of people on the ground, don't know if they're living or dead. And all of her illustrations are digitally cut out and then collaged with these little window frames into various moments. And then the text becomes really incorporated 
into the zine as well. And so if you're thinking about doing an Adobe Spark presentation for your final project, you'd have the opportunity to have something that endlessly scrolls in a digital sense, as opposed to making something that is able to be printed on a traditional eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper. But because you're taking the class online and showing your work online, there's a lot of different options for presentation of the work, whether it's through a website or web presentation or through a exported viewable PDF. So that is uh, an explanation of our projects for the class. And I look forward to seeing what each of you create during our quarter together. Thanks, everyone.